Welcome PCAST members and members of the public who are tuning in by our live stream. This meeting is public and it is being recorded. Information about PCAST can be found at the whitehouse.gov slash PCAST website. And uh, I'd like to note that our agenda has been updated as a result of our meeting with the president later this afternoon. And that updated agenda can also be found at the website. Innovations related to energy are critical to both economic competitiveness and reducing emissions to slow the effects of climate change. With us today is uh, a speaker who will address some of these issues. We're very pleased to welcome Jerry Richmond, who is the Under Secretary for Science and Innovation at the Department of Energy. And in this role, she serves and oversees DOE's Office of Science, the nation's largest, largest federal sponsor of basic research in the physical sciences. DOE, she also oversees DOE's applied R&D areas of nuclear, fossil, and renewable energy, and energy system integrity, and the DOE National Laboratories and their facilities. Welcome, Dr. Richmond. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, now it really is a pleasure to be here because I'm excellent. Okay. I, thank you for inviting me because I'm, uh, I'm terribly excited to be with you. I have number of friends here and new friends to be made. So it's it really is great to be here. Well, I want to uh, take us to the discussion of climate change and uh, climate issues. And I think you all understand that this is an urgent need, an urgent need for science and technology. We have got to find uh, solutions. Next slide, please. Time is running out. In my uh, years uh, in this science and, uh, science and engineering enterprise, I've had the opportunity to cover to go to many countries, and particularly to uh, when I was envoy for the Lower Mekong River countries in Southeast Asia, and a lot of work in Africa. And over the last ten years, I already saw the climate change happening in those countries, with the savannas in Africa changing with the rice fields in Vietnam changing, with the rains in India no longer predictable. In countries that could not afford to buy out and ignore climate change because they didn't have the resources to do that. And I will never forget when I visited a small school in Cambodia, in rural Cambodia, and a room full of, a classroom full of uh, high school students all wanting to know what was exciting about science. And I told them how exciting it was to do science. And one young man said to me, what in your country, this was five or six years ago, what is your country doing on climate change? And what you are doing now is to come to countries like ours and ask us to not take on the technological opportunities that you've had that have ruined the climate. This is in rural Cambodia. And that hit hard, that hit hard. Because now, hopefully with the Biden administration, we can now take it very seriously, not only for us, but around the world. And that's why I've chosen to take on this position and honored to do that because I am tired of having my son say, mom, what are you gonna do about this? Okay, All right, so. Uh, so I'm really pleased again, next slide please, I'm really pleased to be part of this administration with clear climate and energy goals. 2030 reduction in net greenhouse gases to 50 to 52%. And by 2035, uh, by 2035 carbon, 100% carbon free electricity and 2050 new net zero emissions. And to be serving for the phenomenal Secretary Granholm uh, along with President Biden and the team and all of, all of you, because you have taken on this role in service also. This is really a major, we need major innovation breakthroughs that we know we must achieve to solve and achieve these goals. 
it is an all hands on deck call for innovation and all hands on deck. An acceleration of our clean energy economy by tackling the toughest, the toughest remaining barriers to quickly demonstrate and deploy clean energy technologies at scale and to create a workforce that looks like America and reaches all segments of this nation and also the world. So let me describe a little bit about uh, in my uh, position right now. And uh, as indicated in my uh, very kind introduction. So I oversee uh, the Office of Science, uh, which Francis mentioned, uh, nuclear physics, high energy physics, fusion, a lot of exciting things going on in these areas. And my role since I came in in November was really to make sure that we were doing the fundamental science, discovery science, that has no clear endpoint, and also a lot of discovery science, energizing even more science that goes into the uh, energy regime to solve these energy problems. Then on the applied energy side, you can see a whole series of different uh, boxes on the org chart uh, that are really, really important. And with Dan Arvizu here, he knows this intimately well, having been uh, director of of uh, NREL, which by the way, Dan, I was at last week. I'm so excited, I can't stand it. Um, and, uh, but all of these areas in the past, um, in the Department of Energy, there's been a real struggle to connect these two, to really connect them well. Um, uh, being given, and Dan's nodding, have, giving advice to stay in your swim lane, otherwise we're not gonna get funded. Stay in your swim lane or we're not gonna get funded. And we can't afford that anymore. And so my job has now been to break down those barriers, next uh, click, uh, connecting the dots and breaking down those silos so that our biological and environmental sciences reach many of those. Next. So our, uh, our physics areas also go into fusion, into hydrogen, AI, all these different areas. And then our basic energy sciences, which is the largest, uh, as well as our uh, just advanced scientific computing research everywhere, right? Everywhere. <laughs> and then also the basic energy sciences, which is materials and everything, chemistry and physics and computer science and so forth, reaches all of them. And so I'm really excited about the fact that, that the program officers and the directors in on both sides are now coalescing, working together <laughs> to make sure that we have a seamless transition from one to the other. But the thing I keep saying over and over again is that this is not like a relay race where the basic sciences has a baton, passes on to the applied sciences and then runs off to the side. This is really a back and forth, it's a circle. And so we have to stay connected. We have to stay connected so that when you have a problem, you can pull it back uh, into the applied science, into the basic sciences to get after those fundamental issues. And we are on a race for our lives. But in addition to this, um, on the other side of this, which I'm not showing, the other side of this then is, uh, and I'm gonna say the other side because it's down the hall from me. Uh, the other side of, of course, is Jill Ruby's, Undersecretary Jill Ruby, who does all the NNSA. She has the three NNSA labs. She is phenomenal. And then, and we tie in with her on issues of security, on issues, uh, on issues of uh, uranium supply and, and uh, isotopes. And then on the other side is the new, which I'll talk more about too, is the deployment side. And that's Undersecretary Kathleen Hogan. If you didn't notice, that's like three undersecretaries are all women. Um, and, uh, and she is phenomenal too. And so she's taking everything to the deployment side. So now we're trying to break down the, 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 any of the silos across all of this so that we can take it to uh, the deployment, but I'll say a few words uh, about that. And so we're involved in uh, funding university folks in addition to our uh, national lab. So let me say a few words about the national labs because they're on steroids on this issue also. Next slide, please. So as many of you, uh, you know, the 17 national laboratories, um, 14 of them fall under my umbrella. Uh, with the other three going under NNSA, and they are stoked, and they are—they uh, have taken on this mission in serious style. And in fact, several of these laboratories have have uh, set up to do net zero uh, emissions uh, in the next number of years. I can't remember what year it is, but they're just phenomenal. That would be uh, certainly NREL, PNNL, INL. 
uh, and several of the other laboratories. I think Berkeley's in there too. But this is amb an ambitious goal for them. They want to be models for the rest of the nation. And then, of course, uh, in within these uh, laboratories, and I think we have 70, over 70,000 employees at these national laboratories. We then have uh, facilities, 28 user facilities with over 30,000 users per year. And they are working on our light sources, our neutron sources. They are now starting to use our exascale computing at Oak Ridge, in addition to all of our other supercomputers at the labs that are shared user facilities. And then the next one, they'll come up with Livermore. And then our nanoscience centers, five of our energy nanoscience centers, which, and then also uh, environmental and then fusion. I just got back from General Atomics. That was like so exciting. And, and Princeton uh, to be able to really get a sense of the kind of experiments that teams are doing to understand how you reach the optimum condition to reach uh, fusion. And then, uh, and so it's really, it's really a cadre of folks and other facilities too, but it's a cadre of folks, scientists and engineers really excited about doing what they're doing with strong ties to their communities and all over the country with their users and so forth. So let me now uh, pivot to talking about these energy earth shots that we're involved in because we're all uh, working on this uh, together. Our labs and soon our universities will be too and many of our communities and uh, states and so forth around the country. I think everyone I talked to wants a hydrogen hub, for example, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So in this, in this, we are targeting the remaining, with these earth shots, we are targeting the remainder R&D breakthroughs to be achieved. Uh, and to reach the next decade of our 2050 net zero carbon goals. This is a big deal. We have so many people working on this in the Department of Energy, all the way from the Office of Science and uh, through the applied areas and now with the bill money into deployment. And we have very strict criteria about what we're going to call an earth shot because everybody can come up with an idea, but we have very strict criteria. And as you can see here, to advance the reduction of greenhouse or gas emissions, to overcome these last remaining issues that have to be solved, and also be global leaders in what we are doing because everyone's looking at us to be global leaders, even that little boy in Cambodia and to engage stakeholder groups. So, and several other criteria so that we can really hone in on what are the key, key technologies that we've got to have in order to solve these problems. So let's talk a little bit about what those are. Three have been announced so far. So the Energy Earthshot on Hydrogen Shot uh, was announced June 7th and it's ambitious yet achievable to reach cost target to accelerate innovations and spur demand of $1 per kil one kilogram per one decade. So the effort will, will catalyze any hydrogen pathway with potential meeting this targets, such as renewables, nuclear, and thermal conversion. The thermal conversion is the main pathway available today, but it has high emissions. So we need to improve the system efficiency and also integrate carbon capture and storage technologies. Electrolysis is another area for hydrogen. They offer clean production, but are too expensive and we need materials innovations, system design, manufacturing, see all the way through the basic and the applied. What materials are you gonna use? What systems are you gonna use? How do you make them more efficient? Can we get away from precious metals in order to, to do this, to drive down the costs? And also advanced pathways such as bio uh, and microbial conversion processes or thermal or photoelectric water splitting are early stage but they, and they face challenges that we need help with. We need help with. We need to pursue all of these. This means we need everybody on board to help and not just the deal. <laughs> we need anybody that wants to help, any of the agencies too. So that's why, as I'll talk about, we're trying to develop as many partners as we can, break down those silos too. The second is the long duration storage. So uh, this was announced in July 14th and it aims to cut long duration uh, storage, energy storage costs by 90% within a decade. Now, there are cost-effective uh, longer duration storage is necessary to bring out, of course, the more intermittent clean power sources to achieve our clean energy future. I'm sure that all of you would agree, uh, where, whether your computer is plugged in or not, that we need to have better batteries. But you know what I get really excited about is I see the development of batteries for even just EVs. You know, when Ford talks about its F-150, FX or F-150 going out in the boonies and being able to uh, 
support all the equipment that they need to do in order to work out in the field or and then come home if they're energized, their matter is energized and fuel the home for the rest of the night in case the power goes out. Right. So it's a it's a it's a ride along battery. So all of these things, but we got to get better at this. And so with this long duration storage, we must consider electrochemical storage. We need to address key materials availability and find alternatives, reduce the cost systems, improve manufacturing processes for new chemistries and new designs that we need. We need electromechanical storage. The integration and demonstration of these types of systems are, systems are essential and provide promising routes for even longer storage beyond 10 hours. And thermal chemical storage. Uh, we need to continue R&D for materials, components, and system designs. There are so many challenges ahead. That is exciting, but it's also overwhelming in some days. Okay, the third, carbon negative. So climate models now show we need to not only reduce our emissions, but remove carbon, ambient carbon, in order to address our impact on the planet. Because there will be some things that will be hard to decarbonize. So we need engineering solutions for approaches like direct air capture. We need to address the major cost barriers in the capture of carbon dioxide. We need enhanced capture materials, the membranes, the separations, the system designs, and the demonstrations. We also need those natural solutions, so enhanced biological and natural solutions for approaches like soil capture, uh, sequestration. The major challenge is making sure that the carbon captured can be verified as durable storage and fine storage. We need monitoring, verification, and reporting techniques and protocols. I'm so excited about this Earthshot team because they are really going all the way to looking at the economic the economics of doing this, what systems would be economical, and really the barriers that are there, working with our, uh, to plan out where we need to go. So in addition to these, uh, we will be announcing several more uh, earth shots in the coming uh, months. The ones that are on this, the list right now are critical minerals and materials. Oh my God, <laughs> need I say more? Uh, from rare earth elements to copper, to lithium, to, a lot of the periodic table. And uh, the invasion of Ukraine has made this even more critical because of the fact that we've gotten many of these uh, minerals and materials are processed from uh, Russia. We need to find them here. We need to process them here. And I was, uh, I was really excited a, a couple of weeks ago where I went to Mountain Pass outside of Las Vegas. This is one cool place. If you want to go someplace, not, I don't mean cool. I guess I shouldn't say cool. <laughs> it was hot, hot as whatever. And uh, but it, they're they're mining rare earth elements there. And what they, you have to get these rare earths once you, praseodymium and neodymium. Once you get them, then you have to purify them to nine 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 nine, right? And so seeing how they do that is just amazing in the middle of the desert. Uh, while they also, speaking of the desert, they're recycling the water to be able to do this purification and use the same water and over again. There's a phenomenal things going on right now, but we need more. We need to have subsurface energy innovation. And that's not only what's in the subsurface in order to, to find out what critical minerals are there, but also geothermal. That's a hot one. And that was a, that's a good one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting too excited here. Um, uh, but we are very excited about the subsurface uh, energy innovation with regards to geothermal because there's a lot, lot of promise there and we only use a fraction of the geothermal that we have right now. But if you're going to dig that deep, you got to be able to take the heat. And so we have to have new materials that can get down there, uh, get at those materials and, and get to that heat and then pull it back up. Uh, grid modernization. Boy, transformers. <laughs> There is a severe shortage of transformers. So uh, pray next year transformer every morning. <laughs> May I say, because if it goes out, we uh, we have got to be better at, at our own uh, building our own transformers. And so we're working on some of the labs uh, is work, are working on modular systems, which are smaller. Fusion energy, uh, huge promise. White House had a great event on fusion energy. And clean energy technology manufacturing. You know, so much of the energy is lost in businesses and homes and manufacturing, gotta be better at that and industrial decarbonization. Now, if you want something to read, 
uh, there's this great 20, 2015 DOE quadrennial technology review. I still refer to that as getting down into the details of the technologies that we really need. And there's a lot in that. It has, it's not outdated at all. There's a lot in there uh, that you can grab on, on all of these. So those are the ones that we're thinking about now. And they've, it's been hard for them to make the list because every, I mean, everybody else is in uh, making up more lists too. But I also want to make sure that you understand that we spend a lot of time worrying about research security and while we're doing this research, but also issues having to do with security with our, uh, not only policies, but our discoveries. And so the Office of Science recently put out this Office of Laboratory Safety uh, Policy. So we've been working really hard on not only the policies, but how do you make sure when you build up these uh, innovation and technologies, if you need to have uh, uh, um, security associated with that buildup, that we're thinking about it in the early stages rather than plugging it in at the later stages, because this is so important. And so we've been, uh, we've done a number of things in Department of Energy, a science and technology risk matrix. Um, we have a DOE foreign government sponsored or act, uh, affiliated activities uh, guidelines. We've got guidelines on foreign engagement with the national la DOE laboratories and how to work with unclassified foreign national access program, how we're going to watch that and keep track of that, and CRADA and foreign travel orders. We've worked really hard on putting those policy incidents into place for our national laboratories and, and others that can follow. And we're also involved in the interagency working groups. I have to give a shout out to them because we're help, we're working with them and also making sure that our practices are consistent with others. Okay, the next one is this DOE bipartisan infrastructure law. So this provides, oh my goodness, who would ever thought we would get 62 billion to deliver a more equitable clean energy future? buy, and you can see investing in manufacturing uh, and so forth, expanding access to energy efficiency, delivering reliable and clean affordable. You can read this, building the technologies of tomorrow. All of these are incorporated into bills. So let me give you a few ideas of these. 10 billion in FOAs have already been released. That's 3.1 billion to lower utility bills through energy efficiency home upgrades for millions of Americans through DOE's weatherization assistance program. 3.1 billion to boost American battery manufacturing and supply chains. 2.4 billion to support commercial scale demonstration of advanced nuclear reactors. And direct air capture hubs in the next few months, direct air capture hubs for 3.5 billion, regional clean hydrogen hubs for 8 billion. Clean hydrogen manufacturing recycling RDND programs, 500 million. Energy storage demonstration projects, 355 million. Long duration demonstration initiative, 150 million. All of this is in the process of, of rolling out. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but we are we are doing it. And boy, the news last night was too good to believe. I have to say, two weeks ago we had to bring out the tissue boxes. You know, <laughs> everybody had been working so hard and it wasn't looking very good. And I think we're gonna if hopefully. Let's all hope we can turn those tissues into confetti. But you know, we'll just have to sit down. And so um, that's what I hope. So, uh, so whatever you can do, I don't know. Uh, I I couldn't. I shouldn't say more. Um, I have to get careful about lobbying. So, uh, so our, I think our team has just done an excellent job in moving us forward. But I think it's important next one to remember that we can leave no one or no community behind no one and no community behind. Uh, uh, last month, I went up to Alaska, to the remote parts of Alaska, where I watched where they were paying $18 a gallon in some remote parts for diesel fuel to run their communities. They don't have a road there. So a lot of times it's gotta be brought in with a snow plow or by air, $18 a gallon. And I watched that and listened to that diesel run energy, that diesel fuel run, uh, engine run, all 24 hours a day. Imagine your community has that in the middle like you normally would have a park. It's running and it's booming all day long. And yet, near, uh, close to that, in Shugnak, that was at Notec, in Shugnak, they have solar panels, they have storage batteries, and they are just as remote. And that's what DOE has put in. And they turn that generator off 10 hours a day. 10 hours a day, so they have silence. To see how excited people are about that and know it's coming to uh, NOTAC, it just changes the way you look at the world. And we have our tribal communities, for example, we have a lot of activities going on in our tribal community as well as, as the Arctic. We have to make sure it reaches every community. 
Some of you may know that I grew up in remote Kansas, and I know what it means to live in remote areas and the economics that go along with that. We have to make sure that our grid and other things that we do uh, power them. As I said in my, uh, my uh, confirmation hearing to the, the Senator from Kansas, when I grew up in our farmhouse, my dad every morning would shovel coal into the furnace so that the house could be heated. And now 800,000 people in Kansas have a nuclear power plant that they use, no longer coal. So Justice 40 is a key element to everything that we do. And that includes when we think about leaving no one behind and no talents behind in building and sustaining our energy workforce. And I know that this group is heavily committed to this by inclusion and diversity. We all know that the best science is done when you put together people that have different perspectives, different ways of doing things, different science and engineering backgrounds. This is critically important that they are all there. So workforce right now is a critical issue. Our national laboratories are struggling with retention and I'm sure as every other company, including McDonald's, uh, to serve burgers. You know, this is a critical time and we've got to make sure that we have all the talents, all the talents that are there. So as we're struggling with all of these challenges, we have to make sure that our energy workforce builds at a very, very fast rate. But I want to bring up one point that those of you on the National Science Board know that I raised very seriously and very strongly. And that is graduate students and postdoc salaries. We cannot expect young people to go to graduate school in their 20s for five to seven years getting a PhD and make 30 to $35,000 a year. You calculate that out. 50 hours a week, two weeks vacation in a year, that's 12 to $14 an hour. 60 hours a week, which is usually more the norm, um, 10 to $11 and 60 cents an hour. And you almost have to declare celibacy because you can't afford to have kids while you're in graduate school. That was supposed to be a joke, but it's not a funny joke. But the point is that there are people who are having to put off children in their 20s or buying a house are saving money. And these are the smartest people we have in the country. We cannot do this. We cannot do this. So I would really like to see us have a national priority to make sure, and that's what I'm, I'm bringing my case to you too, to make sure that there's a national recognition for it's not just the toys and the, the equipment that we need, but if we don't get the workforce there, if we don't get the workforce there and build it on, we, we're not gonna make it. And more importantly, or as important, is the fact that we know from the data, we know from the data that these kinds of salaries are an impediment for our diverse, for our inclusivity of underrepresented groups. Many of the, of the students coming from underrepresented groups, they don't have a backdrop. They have more finances. They have more, more loans. Their families don't have the support to be able to send them off to graduate school with a car, not that everyone does. But the point is the data is clearly there that if we don't get these stipends up to a good level that's affordable to live on, then uh, we continue to disadvantage our underrepresented groups, which we really wanna have. And one of the final things I wanna bring up is that partnerships are necessary and welcome for success. And this is just a list of the different agencies that we're tied to. Uh, NSF, uh, uh, social science, boy, do we ever need your social science? Oh my goodness. You know, I had one of my program officers say, maybe we need to stand up some social science to understand issues associated with the grid or adopt adoption of some of these solars. And I go, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? We need to go to NSF on that as well as a number of, of other things. So, you know, with the uh, Department of Transportation, uh, working tightly with the Department of, uh, of Transportation, USGS, uh, uh, and BLM mapping out underserviced resources and making sure that we do it environmentally successfully. Uh, GTO and BLM through the, through the interior. Historically, we've met quarterly and now we're on a ramp up to meet much more frequency, frequently to talk about things having to do with permitting and accessibility. NOAA, uh, uh, Science and NSF, we've co-chair with OSTP, a joint action group on Earth's 
research predictability. We're in there with them. NIST, R&D for materials, microelectronics, manufacturing USA network, all partnering with them on these things too. Wind turbine, radar interference, USDA, sustainable aviation fuels. We've got so many partners, but we've got to make sure that everybody, including people, our scientists in, at, at DOE, are ready to partner in and go forward and not so, be so worried about staying in the swim lane, because this is the only way we're going to solve this. And I realize that there are budget issues that, that make it, uh, some people perceive to make it harder, but come on, we got to do it, because we got to have all hands on deck for clean energy for all and by all. Great. That's it. That's it. Jerry, that was fantastic. And um, I'm sure there are lots of questions. And if you have questions, please uh, raise your um, name tags. And I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask uh, the first one. So um, I'm, as you know, right there with you on uh, on the issue of graduate student support and postdoc support. You know, we, um, uh, you know, it's uh, what they're getting is well below a living wage. It's okay? usually up in Cambridge. And, um, yeah. Uh, so when we talk to the agencies who understand the problem, you know, the question, the, you know, the question always arises, but if we raise the salaries, then we yeah. fund fewer. And so what, um, so you know, the, you know, the answer is, well, we ask for more money, right? Um, but that doesn't always work out because the budget you get is the budget you get, and we certainly can advocate and make the case, and we must do that. But, um, but you know, in the near term, how do, how do you think about this? Fewer fellowships with uh, higher salaries, or the status well, quo? I think that I think there's two things to think about. Francis and I and Maria had a discussion the other day, and Francis Francis brought up a very interesting point. Um, so let me just say that. Look, budgets have to, research grants have to go up in their in number because you can't throw this, you can't suddenly say, because my goal is 45,000. Uh, uh, 45, That's my initial goal. But you can't do that by giving some, by having your average grant be 150 or $200,000. And now you're got, you can support one graduate student and you got to get the postdoc salaries up there too. And that for some fields, that means double. So we have to get, we have to get funding that really is directed towards people. And we have to, we have to have some, you, you can't force people to pay, but you can certainly encourage them strongly and have metrics to show that they are paying. If you are giving them the extra money, they're not just doubling the number of graduate students that they support, but they're actually paying uh, those kind of salaries. But back to Frances said to me, um, uh, she said, well, then do we just have uh, fellowships and they can take them wherever they wanna go? You have fellowships like this. So the NSF fellowships, which are phenomenal, and we'd love to be able to do that. In fact, that's what we're talking about doing, coupling with NSF to be able to do that. And and let the graduate, but early enough so the graduate students decide where they want to go with regards to and they are leaving with that 45k that's not enough though if we're going to do that what we have to do is have data on all the institutions that get our funding and find out the success of their graduate students in those programs because we have data that shows that the highest ranked programs do the worst job of mentoring students in the field of chemistry so we got to make sure that we've got the data so that when the students choose, they're choosing not only of the prestige of the institution, but how well the students finish, how well they mentor, just like you do for undergraduates, right? So it's really, I think it's a two-pronged approach. We've got to get the data. We've got to make the data public on who is doing a good job of mentoring their students and, and, and having them finish on all the demographics, while also doing something like these uh, fellowships, because then they're really targeted. They're really targeted. Post the salaries while you're at it. Yeah, and post the salaries. <laughs> yes, and post the salaries. Ooh, that's a good one, Maria. That's a really good one. That's okay. a good one. Uh, yeah. Dan Arbizu. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Richmond, for your for your uh, very compelling presentation. And I can't think of a better person to be leading that part of DOE right now. A um, couple questions, and I, I do resonate with the uh, with the response on on, on graduate students. Yeah, in a very personal way, right? On <laughs> a very personal way, exactly. And 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 I and I would offer. Um, any kinds of any kinds of interventions that we would take, be sure we don't leave out underrepresented 
minority institutions, because mm -hmm. frankly, yeah. uh, we've oh, got yeah. bigger challenges than that in, in, in that arena. I wanted to kind of change um, the, the, the uh, question really on, on, uh, on what PCAS might be able to do to help you and the Department of Energy actually take, uh, you know, accelerate deployment. So uh, in my travels, uh, what I've learned over many, many years is there are three things that it takes to get to deployment, to yes. successful deployment. There's a technology piece. Yes. There's a policy piece. Yes. And there's an access to capital or finance piece. Yes. And there's a Venn diagram that allows you to essentially balance those. And we've been pretty good on the technology side. The deployment side is the part that's missing. And what I detect and, and observe from your leadership here is that the new thing at DOE is essentially the deployment with a... EJ40, under, make sure we don't leave a large fraction of our population behind That's in this right. transition. So That's the right. question has to do with what can we and PCAS do along any of these dimensions that would aid, support, and, and maybe facilitate better efficiency, effectiveness of the things that you're, you, you've got a myriad of things that are going That's on. Right. That's right. How can we be helpful? Thanks, Dan. Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, when you said you've got to have the capital to our LPO office, our loan program office is on steroids uh, to be able to, and they have, it's very much like uh, ARPA-E functioning, but you know, it went away for a number of years and LPO just has a huge difference, uh, makes a huge difference. But, uh, and I could give you examples of, uh, of companies that really, including Tesla, that uh, we actually were able to get going because of a LPO and Ford. Um, but, you know, I think Justice 40 is in everything that we do. It's in every conversation that we have. It's in every, uh, FOI, the FOA that goes out. It's on everything that we do. And so I think, uh, I think it's really, I don't know what other agencies are doing, but I would like to have something like that be the standard for other agencies, not necessarily copying DOE, but just making sure that, that, that the desire to reach broad communities and everything we do, even if we're talking about microelectronics, you know, which you might think end up in Silicon Valley or, or somewhere else, um, that we that we really are reaching uh, everywhere. But the other thing is, you know, it's the slide that I put up that that had the different partners that we've got. Make it okay <laughs> to work across agencies, not just polite, but how to work hard to do it and really do it because this is this you know this is a cultural thing, right? This is a cultural thing. It's been embedded for a very long time, and so if there's a way to to really um, a reward is kind of a funny word, but to to point out you know who's doing a really good job of truly coordinating together because we cannot do this if we stay in our in our uh, silos or our stovepipes. In. And I've seen how hard, even at the Department of Energy and NSF, it can be, but we've just got to, we've got to do that. And then the <laughs> other thing would be, um, uh, I would like to see something uh, that comes out of the White House or from all of you that reinforces the idea that people, the people are the engines that make this go. We can't do any of this stuff if we don't have the people. And we are having a shortage, a true shortage, an urgent shortage of young people. But what gets me optimistic is there's so many young people that want to work on climate issues, right? They want to make a difference. They want to make a difference in the world. They want to make a difference in the world. So that would be my, that would be my asks. Okay. Uh, Laura Green. Thank you for an inspiring talk. It's great sure. to see you and a lot of information. Your whole idea about the interagency workforce is something that I think is very important. And, and you talk about ways that you're trying to make that work. But from where I'm seeing, I'm seeing not only within SF, within DOE, within commerce, there's siloing, but to even work among the agencies, which we so desperately need. We presented this to President Biden a few months ago, and he pointed out how for the cancer moonshot, he was able to do that. And what can we give him as far as ammunition to make that happen? And you've touched on that. And I was wondering if you could give us advice in PCAST and how we could guide 
agencies to work together without siloing so strongly? Yes, well, I think a target is really important, as you would agree to, Laura. And so I don't, you know, for me, it's uh, we're the ones that have selected the earth shots, but these earth shots should be embraced by everybody. You can call it DOEs, you can call it your own, you can call it a moonshot, the White House can call it a moonshot, whatever they want to rename it. Uh, but we have to all get on the same page with a target for a particular type of technology that we need. And I think when we have when we have a goal in mind, um, a mission in mind, we do much better. But when we're just, oh, let's just, you know, how about a little bit of this, a little bit of that with the other agencies, it's not so it's not so easy to do. But if there's a strong message that like we did with Fusion, like the White House did with Fusion, this is what we got to do. And we got to do it together. Well, not everybody can do Fusion. Uh, we hope not everybody. I mean, you know, we don't need any more tritium around. Um, but the point in the neighborhoods. Um, but anyway, I think I think if if there can be strong messages on on, you know, once a month, once a week, big White House event on on one of these, it would be uh, these, I think it would be great. I think it would be great. Great. Thank you. Joe Keani. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my, my question actually relates to Fusion. I wondered your thoughts on a strategy that allows the, these new technologies to have the resources to grow, but still honors commitments to ITER and, and some of the legacy programs. How do you see the uh, DOE moving forward on this? Great question. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we're thick in the middle of that with uh, Scott Sue now is leading an effort. He was in RPE and now he's leading this for Fusion. And he's really great um, in terms of, of um, making me more educated on the different things that are going on and, and uh, mm -hmm. in Fusion. So uh, Princeton last week to look at their uh, system and also General Atomics. And of course, there's Eater. Uh, too, which is uh, a sucker of money. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, doing good, very good things. Uh, and then there's all the private sector too, right? So I was on a call with 17 uh, companies that were raising money, large sums of money that wanted to get in the fusion business. So one cautionary trait is let's not choose uh, which fusion pathway to go down the road based on how much has who has the most money to do it, uh, because it, anyway, because that's a venture capital kind of a thing. But I think what we're trying to do is both because because fusion goes across both in fusion, fusion energy sciences and then across in the applied areas into deployment, it makes it so that we can look, we can now take the fusion energy science program, which we're doing, and start to make sure that we're funding those innovative ideas in fusion that are going forward, while we're also looking for the development and also funding things that, that are really test cases. I mean, at, uh, at um, uh, General Atomics, to see those 40 people sitting at their desk, experimental sitting at their desk and all the screen, you know, it's like the countdown to when they're going to, you know, they're going to fire it up and every, but everybody's got their little experiment going on in there. Right. And, and to me, that's just, it's very exciting because it's not, I thought everybody was sitting in the control room and they're all going to hit the button at the same time. And then it was going to happen. And then we're going to watch the screens, but no, they're watching their own screens to see what happened with whatever variable they put into the into it. So I'm hoping that with the combination and the possibility now of getting some more money uh, as of last night uh, in Fusion, that we'll be able to make sure that the best ideas that need a good start can go. And then there's LPO to go to too. But I want to make sure that the innovative ideas don't get lost. And that's why it's great to have them integrated into the Office of Science, Fusion Energy Sciences with Scott knowing how to take it. When I do this, I mean a basic to applied. I keep doing this arc thing, you know? Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. Well, my, microgrids are becoming more mm -hmm. feasible. Uh -huh. What can you do to help the local utility companies allow for that in a way that doesn't cheat them, but it enables people to do these, whether it's clean energy microgrids or even dirty, they're yeah. still better because yeah. they're not transferring uh, electricity long miles. So anyway, what's what's what can we do? Well, I think that's a, a hard problem, but we've got to solve it. So um, because different people have different, somebody will have a solar panel, Somebody will have something else, you know, could be that that they've got a little bit hydrogen hydrogen thing going on the side, geothermal, 
heating. So we have to be able to make sure that everything can make it to the grid and that the grid can handle different ways. I mean, I'm thinking more towards the future as much as today too. And I was really excited when I visited NREL uh, last week and saw that that's what they're doing. They're sitting there with a grid and they are then trying to hook up three or four different sources at once that would be could be some uh, private or a company to go onto the grid at the same time. What does it take? You know, what kind of what kind of um, devices do we need to make sure that all those things, whether dirty or clean, can go on? So there's science still to and engineering still to be done on that. But I think in the meantime, it's really if if somebody has their own system going on and they're plugging into their their own their city or their own uh, energy system, I, I'm actually part of a um, uh, uh, co-op electric co-op. And a property that a cabin that we have, and uh, so they're struggling with this too because they've got people that want to be off the grid yet they want to sell back in, and they don't. They haven't had the resources to do this. I've seen because regulators have been regulating utility companies. They're working too closely together, and they're not allowing people that want to be micro yeah. to themselves. Yeah, yeah. I was getting to R. Yeah, I was getting to the R word next. Yeah. Uh, and in that case, if there's any help that can be done in terms of policy issues, that would be really great. The reason I've sort of shied away from the R word is because it's so site specific in many cases. It's so state specific, it's so county. But we can't let that stand in the way, right? We can't let that stand in the way. So if there are ways to figure out how to get around uh, those, to, get, to work with those regular, regulators in order to make it, it go. But, you know, that's it's also an issue with permitting too. Right, so that's all permitting to be able to to do do geothermal here or, or or wherever you want to put it. That's going to require permitting too. But again, I can't give a, a, a overview because of the fact that different communities see things very differently. We just have to work more on it. Francis, did you? Sorry. Okay, Kathy. Thank you, Jerry. I want to come back to this question of working across the silos and agency boundaries. I love your phrase of not just because it's polite. I would add, not merely to coordinate. I think we've got to find a way to get beyond that. Yeah. And I particularly wanted to probe uh, and ask what you're finding as you talk to NSF about SBE helping you with the societal dimensions of your issues. Certainly when I was at NOAA, we approached NSF for help on a lot of warning communications. Did and you say what's social and behavioral? Social and behavioral yeah. with SBE. Okay. When I was at NOAA, we talked to them about helping figure out some of the social dimensions of how warnings are received and acted upon. And basically we're told we don't do mission things. So I'm curious whether you think there are program structures needed in addition to just a statement of a goal. Uh, NSF once upon a time had a program that explicitly was research to meet nat national needs. And so had that extra dimension of being oriented towards stated national needs, not just you know, the academically determined next interesting challenge. So what do you think about that? So I got two pages. Of DOE, <laughs> can I have copies? You can of have pages? Them. Yeah, <laughs> I have two pages of DOE NSF collaborations, right? Two pages. It's a new world. It's a new day. Okay. It's a new day, and it's it's. Uh, I'm I'm because I've been on NSF. I'm tight with Ponch. <laughs> Needs to be. Uh, and actually, where we have a um, uh, joint proposal with NSC to work together on AI. Um, uh, because we need to collaborate more even on AI. But our, you know, Dan and our teams, Dan and our teams, they've been working very closely. We haven't hit as much the, the social behavioral sciences as we have some of the other through the applied areas and also, and you know, you can imagine high energy physics and fusion and so forth, they've been tied to NSF for and astronomy too. Um, but on the other hand, we just have to do it. And I think Ponch uh, with uh, us is just, and as Marat, who's head of our Office of Science, we're ready to do, and I think we're all ready to do this. I think we're all ready to do this. Okay. But it's the urgency. I think the urgency makes a difference. Yeah. We found it right. easier on the technical topics than on SBE as well. Yeah. That's good advice. That's good advice. Okay, we're going to go online now, and Dennis Asanis has a question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jerry, thank you so much for your inspiring remarks. Uh, it's wonderful to hear bold vision and uh, all these great ideas uh, that will hopefully get us there in time, uh, the, identifying all the gaps and, of course, setting the, the resources and the agendas. Uh, I, I want to ask you a question about the goals, uh, the, the midterm goals, let's say the 2035 and 2050, uh, recognizing especially the longer term, the 2050 for the net zero emissions is uh, 28 years ago. Uh, there could be several administrations in between. How, in your mind, do we ensure the continuity of thought 
and commitment. What kinds of things can we do today so that we make sure that no matter who is the administration, we don't undo the, the chart, you know, the path uh, to get us there? That's a really good question. And I tell you, Dennis, we think about this every day. Every you. day. It just means we have to work like a bat out of hell. Well, can I say that here? Uh, you know, we have just got to be on steroids to get this stuff done. And that's why the urgency of bill and getting built, get the infrastructure built, get these ties made um, is we're, you know, we're just trying to set things into place so that they have longevity and sustainability uh, regardless of what the next administration looks like or comes in. There, of course, there's no guarantees and you can't build these into concrete. Even concrete can be knocked down too. But on the other hand, I think I'm hopeful and maybe I'm uh, somewhat of an optimist that the seriousness of the things that we see around us right now today with the, with the fires, the heat, the, the water, Lake Mead, uh, that people finally realize that this is across the board. Republicans and Democrats realize the urgency of this if our communities are to survive. That's that's what I'm hoping. But in the meantime, uh, we're not just hitching our goals to a star. We're uh, working on it. You know, one thought I had, and I don't know how realistic it is, oftentimes uh, the, the funding is... Uh, is chunked in, let's say, three-year cycles. I mean, oh. could we, for starters, think about five-year type of commitments in funding <laughs> so that at least it cuts beyond a four-year term of politicians? I, I think that's above my political grade. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I think even, even the Department of Energy, we are now in the process of developing five-year budgets. So we're not just, you know, when you develop the, yeah. the 2024 budget, you can't do that in a vacuum. You have to think about what at least your five or 10 year goal is. And I'm really happy that the leadership of DOE is asking us to do that five year, irrespective of what administration may come in, because we have to have that kind of a, a planning. If we're just doing one year at a time, it's foolish. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, uh, Steve Pakala. Um, uh, it's great to hear the, the DOE's commitment to Justice 40. Um, yesterday, we saw what I hope is the is the um, is the biggest chapter? Well, I know it's the biggest chapter. I hope it holds, and that and that what we now see is a pretty clear policy portfolio that's going to put the U.S. on a track to net zero. And the heaviest lifting, if you just take a look at the biggest terms, the heaviest listing is from from tax cuts, and tax cuts are outside of Justice Forty. It's not an expenditure. So the question is: Does the DOE have a specific program that would allow the historically marginalized to organize in such a way that they could take advantage of tax cuts? Because that's the policy instrument that the government has decided to use. So do your question again. Is there <laughs> so 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 you understand the the premise, right? So, oh, yeah. so since tax cuts not a not a not an expenditure, forty okay. percent of the tax cut doesn't have to go to the historically marginalized. That's right. right? That's Whereas right. if it were a subsidy, it would. Okay. Right? If it, were, if yeah. it were a hydrogen hub, it would. So the question is, has the DOE said, okay, this is now the policy landscape? We've chosen one of the few policy instruments that is outside of Justice Forty, and we're committed to Justice Forty. Should we have a program that is innovative, that tries to come up with ways for those communities that Justice 40 is designed to serve uh -huh. to take advantage of the tax cuts in the law? So that, for instance, can we help them organize community solar, get together with special developers and you know, so on and so forth? Do you have- That are built on the tax cuts. Yeah, so since that's now facts on the ground, and since right. you're committed to Justice 40, and since that's right. where the right. money is, I yeah. thought maybe you'd, yeah. Well, yeah. but, you know, uh, thanks for asking that question, because everything that we send out, whether it's apply for money for this bill or this whatever project, every FOA has within it, you have to address issues of Justice 40. You have to do it, and you will be judged on that. And so we're getting a little bitching and moaning around the edges uh, from folks saying, this is new. Uh, what do you have, you know, what are we going to do? And we say, well, it's not really new. You've been doing that as broader impacts for, you know, NSF for 50 years or whatever. 
but you know that's for us and and then we also have uh various programs that were particularly targeted the leap program for example that are particularly uh targeted for disadvantaged communities so in that we in in, in most every program that we've got uh in the uh energy sector and the applied and and areas uh as well as and particularly deployment you know it's all woven into all of those i mean we think this every day so for us it's not unusual to think this at doe because it's really uh, every morning we have a readout from what's going on from the justice 40 office and what exciting things are happening and leading the way we have shalanda baker is just phenomenal to do that but that's what we can do that's what we can do and make sure that those communities are are served i also want to say though that um we have several new programs with renew and fair programs that are coming out of the office of science which are particularly targeting msis and hbcus to the tune of 200 million dollars uh, over the next five years out of the office of science so you know we have additional programs too that are really making sure that we're getting those uh communities did that get close to answering your question uh, well, I, I, I Oh, okay. and, and it's just but I do think it's been about yeah well I have to say this is new DOE because I've been around DOE for a long time too okay <laughs> all right I mean I only had a BSEC 20 years ago right so I've seen what we've been doing and this is a new day a new day but it our aspirations are high our uh practice has to go there too okay so we've got four minutes left and we have to but we have two questions left so efficient questions and and answers. efficient answers. So, yeah. Oh, oh and, I didn't. And, okay, I didn't see those. <laughs> all right. Well, why don't we maybe just hear all the questions and then, uh, Jerry, you can make a sweeping okay. answer. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, thanks, Jerry. Oh, yeah. really excited about your comments on education in the workforce. And I was wondering if uh, there were specific roles you saw for interactions with community colleges as well as universities, or even some tie between the two. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bill, Bill, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah. Bill Dolly. Uh, but that was my answer. That was okay. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. So, so thanks for a great talk. I was very excited about the earth shots and particularly the one on long duration storage. I was curious what you saw as the most promising technologies there. It really fills the gap. You know, um, solar and, and wind are better on levelized costs than most fossil fuels now, but they're not, you know, reliable, continuous, and, and long duration storage fills that in. And the, then also, how do you address the other gap, which is one of capitalization, which is you want to be, you know, zero carbon electricity in 2035, and you have all these fossil fuel plants that have been capitalized based on a 40-year lifetime. How do you, you know, uncapitalize them? You need to email me with those. Okay. Yeah, long answers for those. All right. Uh, Saul. And this is the question about uh, yeah. the over the years watching um, basic scientists um, who ended up uh, doing very important things in these areas of climate change and, and others. I'm just reminded of, of the fact that um, it's hard to um, have a, a programs that are always getting new initiatives in applied science um, and little by little eating away at that core of, yes. of basic science. So I just you know, curious, uh, you know, your, your take on that, especially as a, you know, somebody who's seen, watch this in the DOE over the years. So your question is how, needing new initiatives, but it, it feeds into, it takes into the core. That little by little um, over the years, we've eroded the, just the basic you know, research infrastructure yeah. where people had uh, local uh, you know, autonomy to actually do uh, research that they were interested in. Um, and then they ended up creating things that made it possible to then solve all sorts of you know, yeah. big problems eventually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and Andrea. Okay, quick question on the moonshots, earth shots. We're talking about 20, 30, 40 years from now. There's many things that haven't been invented yet. There's many things that could be invented if we set up the right structure to get people to think outside the box. And I'm just wondering if you're thinking beyond the programs that you had on your slides, how we would do that. How do we foster bold innovation in this space? Is that it? That's it. Oh, so okay. Uh, first one. Uh, the Earth shots are really a, a decadal plan, right? So they, so they really are. To we hope to be able to solve them in ten years. That said, that's why we have the engine still going on basic science to find out new things. And you know, there will be different things that uh, different problems that arise. We can't predict what's going to happen with climate change. So we're, you know, we'll continue to be on the watch. But you know, this is this administration. Let's see what happens with the next one. But we as scientists have a role to play in making sure that we have an eye on what's the next thing 
bubbling up so that we can make sure that we're paying attention to that in whatever capacity we can pay attention to it, whether it be uh, making agencies more alert or whatever. Um, with regards to um, uh, the core funding issue, with regards uh, what we're trying to make sure that in the Office of Science, for example, we're trying to do 40-40-20. And that is always make sure that the core research is 40% of the budget. 40 then goes to uh, uh, um, operation and, and operations and the other goes to 20 goes to projects or vice versa, one of the two. I just worry about the 40 um, because I don't want to see that erode because you can bring in all kinds of new toys, but you want to make sure that that 40% is still there so the discovery can go. It's just that a lot of that 40% now is more geared towards energy rather than just sort of NSF pure discovery science. But we got our eye on that. Uh, if I ever tried to do anything with it, as Moret had uh, the Office of Science and the Office of Science would uh, be very upset. So we're, I, I get it. I've been this in this for a long time. I totally get it. Yeah. Okay. And then with regards to storage, um, uh, geothermal, you know, you know, it's going to, that hot stuff's going to come out for a long time. So uh, we're, you know, and you don't have a night and a day associated with it. So there's things that that, but also being able to do the storage with it. So, you know, I think we need to look at other ones with regard, other ways that we can, um, uh, new ways of doing, doing energy, including wind, uh, well, wind, but offshore wind to some of those issues are more likely to be continuous. What did I forget? What did I forget? Was it most of it? Okay. Oh, it okay. Gary, okay. Gary, come back anytime. <laughs> all right. All right. And we'll take all the help we can get. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to um, move on to our final topic of this uh, open session. And um, as we all know, the president is laser focused on competitiveness. And as a consequence, we are all laser focused on competitiveness. And um, there has been uh, a great deal of attention and emphasis on semiconductors uh, because of uh, the potential funding of the CHIPS Act, which is poised to strengthen a very critical element of our economy. Uh, PCAST held a public session um, on semiconductors during uh, our meeting in May, and a video of that meeting can be found on the PCAST website. Uh, we started a PCAST working group on semiconductors earlier this year. Uh, it was led by PCAST members Lisa Sue and Bill Dolly, and, um, and uh, they worked like crazy um, to uh, um, try to think about um, recommendations that would be helpful in hopeful anticipation of the passage uh, of the CHIPS Act. Um, we hope we are now on the cusp of the passage of the CHIPS Plus Science Act. Um, and um, our working group is focusing on uh, the CHIPS part. And, um, and here's really a once in a certainly generation um, investment um, and thinking about how we can maximize the, uh, the use of the part of the CHIPS Act funding that would be devoted to research and development. So, um, so I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to Lisa and Bill to um, discuss at a high level their findings and, um, and then, um, you know, in the hope that uh, that the bill passes very, very soon, uh, I'd like to raise the potential issue of a, of a letter that we might send to the president with our thoughts and observations on this. And um, we can see where we all come out on this because we, we need to have some discussion. Um, but I'll turn it over to, uh, to Lisa and Bill to uh, give us a summary. Great, well, uh, fantastic. Thanks, Maria, for that introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss um, our findings for the semiconductor uh, report. Uh, first, you know, I'd like to acknowledge that um, a lot of people have contributed uh, to this report. We had a great working group uh, that spanned across um, industry, academia, um, as well as um, a number of other uh, folks in the various government um, agencies that have given us input on this. So next page, please. Um, so as a bit of background, uh, you know, the key question that we were uh, addressing is, um, you know, the CHIPS Act is a phenomenal opportunity 
uh, to uh, really revitalize the semiconductor industry in the United States. And when you think about, you know, sort of how important semiconductors are to the United States, um, they are really vital to every aspect of our lives. Um, from an you know, economic standpoint, as well as from a national security standpoint. Um, the U.S. does lead in semiconductor revenue uh, today, but our leadership has actually been declining um, over the past number of years. And you know, many countries have been investing a very substantial amounts um, in, um, in semiconductors overall, including manufacturing, research, and uh, development. So what we sought to do with this group is see where could PCAS really add um, value to uh, this opportunity. Next page, please. So when you look at the entire scope of the CHIPS Act, it includes uh, manufacturing as well as research and development. Um, for the manufacturing uh, portion of the CHIPS Act, it's actually been well covered uh, by uh, Secretary Raimondo and industry leaders. They have plans um, to, uh, to really action that as soon as uh, CHIPS passes. Um, however, you know, the research and development piece actually has received a lot less attention. Um, there's um, an $11 billion uh, that is earmarked for research and development in the CHIPS Act. Uh, we think it's a phenomenal opportunity. Um, you know, we uh, wholeheartedly support that. And our goal was to ensure that uh, we could get a jump start on actually implementing um, these uh, these activities as, as soon as possible. So the foundation of um, the uh, discussion is around the formation of a national semiconductor and technology center, as well as a national advanced packaging um, and manufacturing program uh, for the $11 billion. And our recommendation is to build a really a very broad coalition uh, for that in public private partnership, um, including um, you know, the government, as well as academia, as well as industry leaders. And the definition of semiconductors is actually much broader than just people who make chips, but includes um, system companies, as well as equipment companies, um, as well as um, the entire academic um, infrastructure. So uh, we're recommending a broad approach, which would include um, a number of uh, regional centers um, across the country uh, that could come together and, and really build um, this, uh, this uh, capability. Uh, maybe let me turn it over to Bill to address some of the other recommendations. Yeah, so um, to you know, build, you know, to retain our leadership in semiconductors, you know, we have to do a lot of things, and all of those things require talented people. Um, we need talented people to invent new processes and materials, to develop the fabrication equipment, to design innovative chips. Um, and already, there's a shortage of skilled semiconductor workers in the U.S. The Chips Act is expected to create 280,000 new jobs, 42,000 of them directly in the semiconductor industry. And so, to address this workforce shortage, um, we're recommending that a um, National Semiconductor Training Network is formed, and this involves upgrading laboratory equipment in 50 geographically distributed hub universities, having shared curriculum development and shared chip prototyping flows so students can get hands-on experience designing chips and really see those chips um, fabricated, um, um, incentives to hire microelectronics faculty and um, scholarships and research assistantships for students to motivate students to go, go into this field. Um, you know, in addition to developing our own um, you know, workforce, we also need to attract and retain talented individuals um, globally. And to do that, um, we're recommending that existing statutes be used and that the Department of Homeland Security um, grant um, premium processing to immigration petitions for microelectronics workers to speed um, bringing those people on board and getting them, them work permits. Um, you know, once we have the workforce, we then need to sort of you know, put them together in companies and historically, Startup companies have really been the source of a lot of innovation in, in semiconductors. Yet um, last year, fewer than 1% of venture capital dollars in the US went to semiconductor startups. This is down from 8% 20 years ago, and six times as many um, semiconductor startups were created in China as in the US. Um, and the core problem behind these trends is the very high cost of, of bringing a semiconductor product to market, of typically about $500 million to sort of create a state-of-the-art semiconductor product and, and take it to market. Um, and so we have a number of recommendations to try to lower that barrier. One is to um, um, have the, uh, the new uh, National Center um, have a, uh, a fund to uh, create financial incentives and, and prototyping assistance for startups. And another is that this um, you know, uh, NSTC create uh, what we call a chiplet platform, which is basically a chip that factors out the 99% of building a new product, which is not innovative, innovative, it's sort of doing the ante to just get started. And then startups can then build a chip, a small chip that they can put on top of this chip and focus just on their innovation, just on that 1%. And this should greatly reduce the cost of um, you know, 
innovation and hopefully lead to a lot more startups. And then finally, to sow the seeds of our future semiconductor industry is going to require fundamental research in a number of areas, including processes and materials, packaging, um, energy efficient computing, security and, and applications in the life sciences. And to make sure this research gets done, we recommend that the NSTC devote 30 to 50 percent of its budget to fundamental research and that it focus a lot of this fundamental research on a number of grand challenges, um, things like creating a Zeta scale computer, computer that's a thousand times more powerful than what we have today. And so we think that by doing this, um, you know, by taking advantage of this really once in a, uh, in a generation opportunity, um, that we can you know, sustain and, and, and remain and grow our leadership in semiconductors um, through um, workforce, um, startups, and, and research and development. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we're gonna we're gonna open it up for um, for some questions from the uh, um, from the PCAST, uh, and I just want to say that what they presented here is just kind of high level recommendations of a more detailed report that um, the the working group hopes to uh, submit to PCAST within the coming months. Okay, um, but but let me um, just start off by asking a little bit about um, the stakeholders that you consulted with and that, uh, um, you know, on, on which you uh, gathered your information. How broad was it and, um, you know, who was involved? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we did seek to have a very uh, broad set of um, discussions. Um, you know, if you look at the representation in the working group, um, it uh, is across both uh, companies with manufacturing as well as uh, design uh, capabilities. Um, if you look at the academic institutions, also a broad set of both research and um, and teaching universities. And then um, from um, the agency standpoint, actually, we got great uh, feedback from uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, which has been given um, really a lot of the mantra for uh, implementation of chips, as well as um, NSF, um, DARPA, and, um, you know, a broad, uh, broad cross-section. So I feel like we got a very good participation. And frankly, there's a lot of energy and excitement um, in, the, uh, in the industry around uh, what, uh, what we can really do here. Yeah, and, and beyond that, we actually... Um... You know, early on in the study, we had a lot of you know, meetings with our working group and people outside the working group. This included a lot of representatives from the EDA um, industry, which is a part of the semiconductor industry that was not represented in the working group. Um, we had a really good meetings with people from IMAC, which is a European semiconductor consortia, whose goals are very much like what this NSTCs would be. And there's a lot that can be learned from the Europeans. They've actually gotten a great model um, going on this. Um, is as well as from a number of startups. We met with a lot of people from the financial community, venture capital groups uh, that fund semiconductor startups. Um, so we think that we've, we've taken a really broad survey, not just of the semiconductor industry, but a lot of adjacent industries that, that either supply or consume from the semiconductor industry. Um, and, and also, as Lisa mentioned, we um, had meetings with the various agencies that will be affected by the recommendations. We, we found a great deal of resonance there that uh, people were very happy with uh, the direction the report is going. Okay, great. Um, is that Joe? Thank you. This is a great uh, recommendation you're making. And while I really appreciate well, well, it's really good to see that we're trying to build back our R&D leadership in semiconductors. What during the supply chain problems of COVID, related to COVID, our lack of fab in the United States was exposed and our dependence on Asia, um, I think is what one of the things we're trying to make sure we get rid of. So how does your recommendation help that as well? Yeah, absolutely, Joe, uh, thanks for the question. Um, there's no question that onshore manufacturing is uh, very much on um, everyone's mind, and uh, that is a, certainly a large piece of the CHIPS Act. Um, when we look at the research and development funding um, and the um, opportunities there, you know, we're really talking about filling the pipeline so that we have the technologies for the next generation of, um, of semiconductor uh, manufacturing and design that are, are that are necessary. So you know, think about it as you know the pipeline is just as important, and frankly, it doesn't get as nearly as much attention uh, because it is a long you know life cycle. And so you know this is an investment that we're making really you know for the next decade, um, and we'll rebuild you know the semiconductor talent as uh, as we mentioned in, in addition to the facilities and the capabilities and the research programs around that. 
Francis Arnold. Bill, uh, Bill Lisa. <laughs> Did you get any pushback from any of the agencies that might be impacted or some of the stakeholders that you talked to on any of these recommendations and what were the complaints or pushbacks? I don't think we really got any, any pushback from the agencies or from the stakeholders. I think there are some people um, in the industry and on the manufacturing side of the industry who might like to see a larger fraction of the you know, 11 billion R&D go strictly to prototyping facilities they can use to develop their next generation processes. But I think that on further reflection, even they would realize they also need you know, workforce and they need fundamental R&D and that a balanced approach is a better approach. Among the agencies, you know, I've, you know, you know, there are people at NSF, for example, mentioned that, gee, we've been you know, doing fundamental research for a long time. Commerce should work with us. And in fact, you know, we recommend that there be a coordination among agencies in the report. Terry Tao. Uh, yes. So um, in past decades, uh, the, the progress in cement detectors has mostly come from Moore's law, okay? increasing the density on, on chips and so forth. So my understanding is that this law is kind of reaching its course. It's ending now. And it, it's, it, uh, maybe I'm, I'm mistaken, but like, uh, is, 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 there, is there a shift in sort of uh, the priorities of, of where the semiconductor research is going and are we kind of prepared for? Yeah. Well, that, that, that's a really good question. So, you know, Moore's law is, is defined by Gordon Moore in a, in a 1960s paper is really an economic law. It's about the reducing the cost per transistor over time as line widths um, shrink. And, and various people have attributed other things to Moore's law, but that's what the original law is. And, and even though, um, you know, Pat Gelsinger in his testimony to this committee at, at our previous meeting said that as long as there's, you know, squares left in the periodic table, Moore's law won't be dead. Our observation is that Transistors aren't really getting any cheaper with each succeeding debt uh, generation. But this actually, I think, raises the stakes um, to invest more in R&D because we can't simply turn the crank the way we have in the past, go to a smaller line width, and wind up with greater capabilities. Um, now we actually have to think harder about it. And, and things like um, you know, domain-specific architectures to make more energy-efficient computing um, become important alternatives to give us that increased value um, you know, more computing per dollar, more computing per watt that a lot of industries depend on for, for their you know, progress down the road. So I think that the, the end of Moore's law actually creates an even larger need to invest in, in fundamental research and, and to create this workforce to do it. And maybe, Terry, I would just add to that. Um, in the uh, detailed report, uh, we actually spend um, a bit of time on some of the topics that will help us, you know, sort of go beyond Moore's Law. So, you know, things, as as Bill mentioned, on um, design and architecture, as well as packaging and, and other areas. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Lisa and Bill, first of all, uh, my compliments for a great report and some excellent, very well-balanced recommendations. Uh, Clearly, to ensure the competitiveness of our country in this critical industry, one needs to take this balanced view among R and D, uh, manufacturing in the in the U.S., uh, workforce development, access to capital for startups, and so on. So, recognizing that all are your children, is any one of them more on the critical path? Uh, kind of like the Achilles heel. That if you don't have that, that's that's a prerequisite for everything else. What would you say? Should I start or should you start, Bill? <laughs> I, I, well, you know, I think, I think you know, we, we love all of our children. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think if, you know, if I were to pick the one thing which is really critical here in, in our recommendations, right now it's the workforce. Because unless you have the people, you don't have anything else. I mean, you're not going to get the research and development done. You're not going to have anybody to staff your startup companies. So I think it's almost a prerequisite for everything else is to, you know, you know, have a skilled workforce in microelectronics, and then the other things can follow. And I don't know. They, Lisa would they, like to then they've got to have something to do, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, There's plenty for them to do. Uh, and, and <laughs> maybe maybe I'll just comment that um, you know the beauty of this is you know as as we said we're we're on the cusp of having the Chips Act passed, and with eleven billion dollars, I mean it is a very, very significant, um, you know, sort of injection into the system that would allow, you know, the, the facilities infrastructure, the R&D, the workforce, as well as, um, you know, the startup uh, funding. So I, I think it's a very, you know, balanced view of, of all of the wonderful things that, uh, that can be done. Okay, and our final question. 
Thank you, Sancho. Well, that's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I, I too am very excited about this report and the focus on restoring competitiveness here. I am curious on exactly this topic of the workforce. How, how much work do we have to do on the educational front? To, to before we can hire people, we need to train them. We need to inspire them to want to work in this field. And we've lost ground there, a lot of ground. So what have you learned about um, what our responsibilities and investments should be on the educational front and how far back do we have to go? Fourth grade? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, ideally, we'd, we'd like to get, and it goes into a broader question of STEM education that I don't think we should get into right now. So ideally, we should go back you know, to kindergarten and get them starting to do science experiments then. But I think our, our focus is really you know, with under, starting with undergraduate education. Um, and I think a, a big part of the problem is a motivational one, is to getting you know, students you know, going into an undergraduate career to choose to study microelectronics as opposed to other things that, that they could choose to study. Um, and then other parts of it are then creating the pro appropriate infrastructure in terms of laboratory facilities, curriculum, chip prototyping flows that then once they've chosen that can give them a very positive experience um, getting through so that they can become you know, skilled workers that, that we can then you know, move into the industry to solve a lot of these challenges that, that we have. So, so the timeline here um, is really one of the this time span of an undergraduate education, you know, you know four years total, a half-life of, of two years if you intercept some people um, in the middle. Thank you. Okay. Um, you've all read the letter. Um, I hope your questions have been answered um, during this. Are there any objections around the table to taking a vote on whether we should send a letter to the president with these high level recommendations, realizing that a more detailed report will follow in a month or so? Just to clarify, I think what we considered as the best way for such a letter to be submitted is for it to be basically from the entire PCAS, uh, recognizing that we are having this discussion, not just with the working group, but with the rest of the assembled uh, wise heads as well. So I just want to be sure that was understood. If okay. we're going to send a letter, it comes from- It comes from, side. yeah. So the, uh, the, the letter comes from PCAS and everybody agrees to what's in the letter, okay? Okay, I don't see any objections. I move we sign the letter. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. There may be some copy editing to clean up any grammar things that turned out not to be quite right, but you've all seen the version uh, from earlier today, and I think it will essentially be that with uh, an effort not to have any embarrassing lapses in tenses or other such things. So thank you all. That's uh, and, and I have to say for myself here as, as co-chair, the timing here is just exquisite. <laughs> uh, we do expect, I'm just peeking at the uh, internet, that the House of Representatives is planning to vote today uh, for the bill that was passed uh, through the Senate uh, just uh, yesterday. And so for PCAS to be positioned here, uh, to put forward recommendations about what would be the best use of the $11 billion in that uh, particular uh, appropriation for research and development uh, could not come at a better time. And uh, congratulations to everybody who works so hard, especially Lisa, Bill, and your team, because um, it isn't like you just came up with this last night. These people have been <laughs> working on this for months, never quite knowing exactly how the timing would play out. And once in a while, it plays out pretty well. Of course, fingers crossed that nothing trips up the whole thing <laughs> in what's happening right now on the Hill. So um, I think at this point, we are supposed to move into public comments, uh, but I note that we did not receive any requests for public comments. Uh, so that will be a very brief segment. <laughs> in our public session. So I think at that point, then I can remind the audience uh, that the recording of this public meeting will be available on the PCAST website next week. Um, and we will uh, actually uh, have a special experience later this afternoon. PCAST will be meeting with the president and uh, we'll have a chance uh, to share some of the things that PCAST has been working on, including uh, this semiconductor effort, but also uh, other projects. And uh, that is obviously a fantastic opportunity. And we are delighted that we'll be able to meet with the president in the room because of uh, his rapid response and recovery from COVID-19. So I think with that, uh, hearing no objections, 
we can adjourn our public session and thank all of you who have uh, zoomed in uh, to hear the discussion. And uh, we will reconvene uh, PCAS will in a different location uh, shortly. Thank you all very much. <laughs>